Today, we're going to continue our study in the book of John. And I am going to be reading to you out of the complete Jewish Bible. And if you wonder why I keep doing things like this, it's, well, when I'm studying and... Um, <laughs> And God begins to reveal something to me. I just take it from there. And I find that if I try to go with something else and try to make it all nice and neat, I lose the anointing and lose what God just gave me. And I figure that's probably not the best way to go, right? <laughs> all right. We're in John chapter five. Now, I want to just remind you briefly about what happened in John chapter four when we were talking about the nobleman's son? There were some key things about that particular healing that we emphasized. And one of them was that it wasn't an instant healing, right? Somebody say amen. amen. It wasn't instant. It said that he, his son began to amend from that moment. So he began to get better. And yet still the Bible calls that a miracle. OK, and then the other thing that I want to uh, point out is and that was the name of the, the message was when when you don't get what you ask for, but you get what you want. Part one, <laughs> <laughs> when you don't get what you ask for, he asked for Jesus to come to his house. And heal his son. But Jesus didn't do what he asked. Jesus just said, go. Your son lives. So he didn't get what he asked for, but what did he really want? What he really wanted was for his son to be healed and his son to live. And so he got what he wanted. And sometimes in our own thinking and our own imagination and our own makeup or how we like things to be orderly, we think we know how something's going to work and how we want it to work and how it's going to come about. And yet the answers to prayer when you approach the Father in the name of Jesus, the answers to those prayers don't always turn out exactly like you thought. Or is it just me? No, sometimes the answers come in unusual ways. So we go from this miracle, which was a miracle that was not instantaneous, but it was a beginning of recovery and we go into John chapter 5 and we're and John is giving us this specific next miracle it says after this there was a Judean festival and Jesus went up to Jerusalem now in your bible it may say there's a festival of the Jews is that what your bible says mm -hmm. but because this is the complete Jewish Bible by David Stern, then he's looking at from a Jewish standpoint. <clears throat> and in reality, when it talks about the Jews rejected Jesus, not all the Jews rejected Jesus. Peter was a Jew. His disciples were Jewish. So the, in, those who have uh, interpreted the Bible and have translated it, failed to give the meaning there were the unbelieving Jews and then, then there were the believing Jews. The Jewish race did not reject Jesus. Jewish people rejected Jesus. Got that? So you remember also that I told you that Ju Judea and Jerusalem was a dangerous place to perform miracles. Remember me telling you that? Mm -hmm. Judea was a dangerous place because they were the ultra-conservative um, Jewish religious bunch, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin was there. There was all kinds of judgment uh, attached to them. And Jesus himself said, you don't have the love of God in you. You don't know anything about the love of God. And so Judea was a dangerous place, whereas he had more freedom in Galilee, he had more freedom in Samaria. So it says after this, there was a Judean festival. So this indicates it was not a specific Jewish festival that we know like uh, Pentecost or 
one of the other Jewish festivals. It was a Judean festival of some sort. So he goes to Jerusalem and it says in Jerusalem by the sheep gate is a pool called in Aramaic Bethsaida in which lay a crowd of invalids, blind, lame, crippled. This must have been some sight to see all of these people with these extreme problems laid by this pool. And yet this is where Jesus passed. And when you read about this and you think about people who are blind, they didn't have all the things we have today where they can have education, they can have all these. I mean, if you were blind, you were that was just it. You had no way to earn a living except by begging. If you were lame, you couldn't earn a living. If you were an invalid, crippled, the word uh, here for crippled is often translated invalid. And if you've ever been around a person who is an invalid, they're unable to do anything for themselves. And what they wouldn't give to get out of that situation and be able to do things for themselves, to have to depend on another person for everything. I mean, not just to lead them there to get them to buy this pool, but for everything in their life. And so verse four, there is controversy about verse four. So verse four, let me pull it out because they didn't, in this version, they didn't actually quote it. There's a lot of controversy about this. And I think it's hysterical, some of the things I read about this particular verse. It says, in these, in this, these lay a great number of sick folk, blind, crippled, some paralyzed, waiting for the bubbling up of the water. And I don't know if you have uh, the King James, but here's what he says. For at certain times, an angel of Adonai went down into the pool and disturbed the water. And whoever stepped into the water first after it was disturbed was healed of whatever disease he had. Now, there's a great deal, actually not much of a controversy because most of them say this, this verse wasn't even part of the manuscript. It wasn't even in there. And reading their reasons for why they believe that is some of them are legit and some of them are, there's no such thing as angels coming down to fools of water. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I said, you've got to watch some of these commentaries. Um, but it jumps forward. Let's jump forward and then I'll come back to that. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. Yeshua, seeing this man and knowing that he had been there a long time, said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is disturbed. And while I'm trying to get there, someone goes in ahead of me. So if we didn't have that verse, why would this make much sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it could be that someone added it later, knowing, um, you know, what happened, because this couldn't have been something that was quiet. Nobody knew about this. Mm -hmm. I mean, if if somebody got in the pool of water and was instantly healed, don't you know the whole town knew about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did. So it could be that someone inserted it after the original manuscript to to clarify it. But one of the um, scholars I read after, and I use that term lightly. It says about John 5, 4, the biblical critic is glad that he can remove these words from the record and cannot be called upon to explain them. <laughs> All right, that, that deserved a laugh. <laughs> oh yes, these words aren't really there. That didn't really happen. There's no such things as, as angels stirring the water. We know that that's just some kind of voodoo. Right. So I don't know whether it was in the original manuscript or not. Maybe not. But someone at some time used this probably to explain it because of personal knowledge of what had been happening. Now, the question is, was it really an angel stirring the water or did something just happen there they believed was an angel? Well, here's where we get into what my dad called the placebo effect. Mm -hmm. Right. What difference does it make? Right. Right. You know, I've heard people say. 
you know, somebody goes in and is, is, has their hands laid on them, anointed with oil to be healed, and they get healed, and their preacher comes and tells them, now that's of the devil. You shouldn't have had that done. That's of the devil. And I remember Brother Hagen telling a story one time about a man who hadn't walked for I don't know how many years, totally crippled. And the pastor came by and he was outside working in his yard, moving things. And that pastor said, you've got to come. To, I've got to talk to you because this, this you're in error. This is heresy. And sat in the house and talked to the man until the man sat there and became crippled in the chair where he sat. Mm -hmm. Now, who do you choose to believe? For, unfortunately, the man didn't have enough of the word in him to go get out of my house. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is not in the word of God. It's not in the word of God. But obviously people were being healed here. And so when Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? The Greek there is, do you will to be healed? Do you have a will to be healed? Do you intend? Are you resolved? Are you determined to become sound? That's the, the gist the Greek gives of it. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between, yeah, I want to do something and I will do it. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between I'll try and I will. There's a difference between I am resolved and I'll try to. There's a difference between well, if it works out, okay, and I am determined to. Mm -hmm. So the question there is, do you will, do you have the will to become, there's that word that I like again, it's that genomai, become sound, well, and healed. And the man says, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is disturbed. While I'm trying my best to get there, someone goes in ahead of me. The man could only see that the, the, the only way he could be healed is if someone sat there with him night and day. I don't know if he was there at night, but someone sat there with him every minute until the water bubbled up and got him in there first. It's not that the man was in unbelief. It's not that the man didn't believe. It's not that he didn't want to be healed. It's that he only saw one way for this to happen and no one was willing to make the sacrifice to sit with this man for 38 years by this pool until the water bubbles. We don't know how often it happened. There was no one that was willing to do that. But the only way he could see that he could get his prayer answered <clears throat> or get what he, he was asking for was to get someone to help him and someone to put him in the water. Now, I ask you, did this man get what he asked for? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, no, no, because he was asking for someone. He help. was asking for someone to put him in the water. Yeah. But what Jesus said, get up, pick up your mat and walk. Get up, pick up your mat and walk. That, that wasn't it. That wasn't it. That wasn't, what, that wasn't what I prayed for. Wait a minute. What? That's not what I prayed for. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's not what I prayed for. But what was the end result? Was it what he wanted? Mm -hmm. Now let's go back and look at something else. Verse 9. Immediately the man was healed. Immediately. Mm -hmm. Not over a period of time. Immediately. So we've got the previous miracle was the boy began to amend. And this one, immediately, the man was healed. He picked up his mat and walked. Now that day was Shabbat. So the Judeans said to the man who had been healed, it's Shabbat, it's against Torah for you to carry your mat. I 
Okay, this, this, this to me is equivalent to see, <clears throat> seeing a pond along a roadway, along a highway, and there's a sign that says no trespassing. And that, that uh, property owner has the right to put those signs up, has the right to enforce no trespassing on their property, right? Mm -hmm. The law backs that up. And yet, if someone drives off the road, drives into the pond and is drowning, and someone sees this happen and jumps in and gets the, the man out of the car and saves his life, the property owner says, comes by and says, don't you see that sign, no trespassing? And everybody would go, are you out of your ever loving mind? Are you kidding me? You're going to prosecute that guy for pulling the guy out of the car when he was about to die because it says no trespassing? What's that? Really? Seriously, it's Shabbat. You can't be healed or carry your mat. Now, there's a side note to that, but <clears throat> we'll kind of jump over that for right now. So anyway, the, uh, the, the unbelieving Jew said, the man who healed me, he's the one who told me, pick up your mat and walk. I didn't, he told me to. I'm just doing what I was told to. <laughs> so that tells you how, where this man was. Not that that was bad. And I had a really intense letter from a lady one time who was an invalid in a wheelchair. And she said, unless you've been in a wheelchair and been an invalid, you don't know what it's like. Even though you want, you need to get out of your, there's such fear because once you get down, you can't get up again. And so she felt like I was placing some kind of blame on this man, which I, I'm not. But it, it was a question that was directed to him. Are you, do you have the will to be healed? And yet you could see his mind went to where if he was going to be healed, it had to be this way, right? And it came a completely different way. <clears throat> so the man who healed me, he's the one who told me, pick up your mat and walk. And then they ask him, who is the man who told you to pick it up and walk? But the man who had been healed didn't know who it was because Yeshua had slipped away into the crowd. Afterwards, Yeshua found him in the temple court and said to him, see, you are well. Now stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Is there a connection between sin and sickness? Absolutely. Sin brought sickness into the world where people err is they think anyone that is sick has committed some kind of a sin. Sin and sickness are connected, but obviously this man, Jesus said, stop sinning or something worse may come upon you. So he's saying if you persist in your sin or in not repenting or not turning your ways, that something worse could happen to you. That's a warning. Now think about this. First of all, Jesus goes and he walks through a place where, I don't know, there could have been a hundred people there. I don't know how many people were there, but there were a lot of people at the pool of Bethesda. Lots of people. And so you ask the question, what about all the others? I mean, this is the question that all of the um, uh, skeptics have. Well, Catherine Kuhlman had a great healing ministry, but look how many people left that didn't get healed. You know, Benny Hinn prayed for these people and yet some of them didn't get healed. So therefore healing's not right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. So Jesus passes through and there's many people. Why didn't Jesus heal every one of them? Has that thought ever occurred to you, or is it just me? Why, why, why this one man? Well, to me, it connects back into Jesus' teaching when he says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one is lost, he leaves the ninety and nine and goes and gets the one. And so this one man we know was a sinner, right? 
Do you read that in your Bible? This man was a sinner. Jesus said he leaves the, oh, the 90 and 9 and goes after the one, the sinner. And then again, we look and we see this man had been this way 38 years. That's a long time. Yeah. I mean, they didn't even live real long during those days. So Jesus walks through there. Now think about this. He walks through. Let's say, let's say you had a healing anointing and you walk through a place of 100 people. And I'm just throwing that number out there. You walk through a, pl a place of 100 people. Where would you start? Who would you go to first? Think about it. Would you go to the one who has a head cold? Would you go to the one who banged up their foot playing basketball? Or would you go to someone that had been in a wheelchair? Let's say you knew the healing power was there. You knew it was there. You knew you only had one minute. Who would you offer that healing power to? It just makes sense. This man was a sinner. This man had been sick a long time. He was an invalid for at least 38 years. Now, why did Jesus only have one minute? Now, I'm just, I'm throwing that figure out. I don't know how long exactly he had, but I knew it was short. Mm -hmm. Because the minute that man was healed, Jesus' life was in danger. Mm -hmm. They were going to kill him. Mm -hmm. That was going to be the end of it. And the plan of God would have been thwarted. It's not that Jesus didn't want to heal everybody there. It's that he had one minute. And in that one minute, he chose somebody that was the most grievously tormented for the longest period of time who was a sinner because he knew the healing would turn him to God. One minute, just think about it, one minute. Jesus couldn't perform one more miracle. He couldn't stay there one minute because they started, they came and began looking for him. They would have killed him. So there were limitations that were in the natural realm in Jesus' ministry limitations he had to make sure the plan of god was carried out and how amazing and wonderful that he walked through at that time and was able to help that man but you know i want to i want you to notice something else here jesus said get up and the man got up the man didn't say well I can't that's what I'm telling you I can't get up so here here's the human explanation here you don't understand I can't get up and I, I have watched I watched a healing service not long ago where a woman was there and she was deaf and the man was speaking to her and telling her can you hear me and she was arguing with him and he said can you hear me and, he, and, and she was like well, I'm telling you, I'm deaf in this ear. He said, can you hear me? And she was talking to him. She would not let go of the deafness. She was hearing and answering questions, but she she was so stuck on her story. And this is what humans do. They get stuck on their story. But you don't understand. I'm deaf in that ear. But can you hear me? I told you I'm deaf in that ear. She kept answering back, hearing through the deaf ear and saying she was deaf. And he kept saying, I want you to say, I can hear, but you don't understand. I can hear, she said. And he was talking to her and she was hearing and the whole crowd was sitting there going, watching this demonstration of God having healed her and her not letting go of the deafness and the sickness. Fascinating. Fascinating. All right, so. I want to conclude this with another observation. You notice this is a pool. A pool holds water, right? Mm -hmm. So again, let's go back to the first miracle. What was the first miracle? Turning the water, water into wine. The transformative power. 
from water to wine. Water is a liquid. It can be used for many different things. And this time it was transformed into wine from its natural state of water. Number two, the second mention that we have that John gives us is that, that John the Baptist was baptizing in water. He was cleansing in water. And this even goes back to the water into wine. What kind of vessels were used to turn the water into wine? It was the purification vessels, right? That were filled, the great big ones. Remember I was telling you about those huge, they were used for purification. Water used for purification, for cleansing. John the Baptist dunked people in water. It's called immersion. <laughs> It's a cleansing, not, yes, it's physically cleansing to be dunked into water, but it was the representative of the cleansing from sin. The woman at the well was an issue around water. What's in a well? Water. Water. And what did Jesus say to her? If you'd known who you were talking about, you would have asked me and I would have given you living water and you would never thirst again. Again, we're looking at water. The pool of water at Bethesda was living water. And so the water was there and, and it was there for healing. There's evidence archaeologically that it was used for like a spa, like a spa. So the water was there for healing and restoration of hell. And yet, guess what? the living water Jesus walked by. The living water came to the man of 38 years of infirmity. The living water came and gave to him. Jesus goes on, and we'll, we'll find out as we continue with our study of John, when Jesus stood up at that last great day of the feast. He that is thirsty, let him come unto me, and I will give you springs of living water, spring up into everlasting life. John declared that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He is the light and the life, and he is the living water. What a beautiful example that John gives us and then, of course, we all know that as we're filled with the Spirit of God, with the Holy Spirit of God, that's the living water that bubbles up within us and flows over. And as it does so, it cleanses us, it heals us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Good stuff.